afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's live call, Weathering the Coronavirus Market Downturn. My name is Darcy O'Brien, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Simon Quick, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Our goal in hosting these calls is to help you capitalize on the changes we've been seeing in global financial markets. We also hope to address any of those financial concerns that may be keeping you up at night. So please don't be shy and use the Q&A function on Zoom to submit your questions. You may also submit questions by emailing me at dobryan at simonquickadvisors.com. I'd also like to mention that there is a visual component to this call, so if you have access to a screen, go ahead and click on the Zoom link, which will allow you to see my video and slides with some useful information. Lastly, this call is being recorded and will be posted to our website and circulated over email tomorrow. Now, before I dive into the questions, please note the following disclaimers. This presentation is for information and discussion purposes only. Please remember that past performance may not be indicative of future results, and there is no guarantee that the concepts and ideas discussed during the presentation will be profitable or prove successful. Now let's introduce our panelists. Today we have with us our Chief Investment Officer and Managing Partner, Chris Moore. Thanks, Darcy. Happy to be here. Hi, Chris. We also have our Head of Investment Research, Wayne Yi. Hi, Darcy. Great to have you, Wayne. And lastly, we have our Head of Financial Planning, Bill Laylor. Hi, Darcy. Hi, Bill. So I'm going to start with the questions we've received over email, and then we'll dive into the queue and respond to questions in the order in which they were received. Our first question comes in from Rohan. I have heard you say that your underweight cyclicals, such as small cap and emerging markets, at what point will these areas become opportunistic? And a follow on to that, what about financials and energy? Thanks, Darcy. I can take that one. Um, yeah, as a reminder to those on the call, uh, we, we are underweight cyclicals and overweight higher quality. Um, and within the cyclicals area where we're underweight, small cap and emerging markets uh, are included. So we're not entirely out of small cap and emerging markets. Uh, we've just shifted exposure um, from those areas within equities to more higher quality companies um, where some sectors where we are now kind of overweight are technology and healthcare. Uh, as we think about when small cap and emerging markets might become interesting again, I would just highlight, you know, despite the run up in the market since the low on March 23rd, you know, where now equities are up 25% or so, um, we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, there's still plenty of uncertainty within the economy as it relates to uh, unemployment and GDP growth and when those will begin to normalize again. Uh, we also have an, uh, an earnings season ahead of us for the second quarter, which uh, at this point, a lot of companies have stopped giving really any guidance because they um, can't accurately uh, say what's gonna happen in the next quarter or two quarters or four quarters based on what happened with the virus and um, when states will be opening and businesses will be allowed to reopen again. So our view is um, emerging markets and small cap and more cyclical names, um, we'll, we'll, we're still not putting fresh dollars to work there just yet. Uh, we're not increasing our exposure. Uh, we wanna get through kind of the next quarter or so or two uh, before we start um, shifting risk uh, in those areas. Uh, we just think there's there's too much uncertainty um, to be taking that kind of a position within the equity portfolio. That being said, we still re remain um, target weight to equities. Uh, so we've just positioned the equities in a different way with the focus on quality. You know, with healthcare um, being potentially a multi-year theme for us, uh, as we rebound after this pandemic and um, dollars are, are, are put into the healthcare as an industry in preparation for, quite frankly, uh, just being better positioned uh, for future potential pandemics uh, so that we're able to weather um, the storm, not just this fall, 
but later, the next one, uh, better. And technology as, a, as an industry, there are certainly subsectors we like better than others, um, but that's a multi-year theme too. And we think we'll likely have exposure there uh, for a while. With, uh, within energy and financials, which was also part of that question, uh, financials are incredibly attractive from a valuation perspective right now. Uh, Well-run um, companies, balance sheets are sound, uh, but uh, the truth is with interest rates so low, it's very hard for the large banks and financial institutions to generate much in the way of return. Um, because their net interest income um, is 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 low based on the low rate environment, so um, you know there isn't a whole lot of kind of optimism around financials as a sector uh, because of that, and they too they do tend to be cyclical in nature. Uh, but you know purely from a valuation basis, uh, they are cheap, and fundamentals are sound. Uh, so energy on a, is kind of a different story. A highly volatile sector, very out of favor, you know, with concerns around excess supply and demand really falling off a cliff. Um, energy as a sector has certainly taken a beating up until the last week or so, where it's rallied a bit. Uh, we're we're still cautious on energy as a sector, and have not been allocating um, to that area really at all. So I don't envision that changing. Uh, anytime soon. Thank you, Chris. Our next question comes in from Lena. Does it make sense to sell equities at this point? Simon Quick increased our equity target when the sell-off occurred, so clients may now be overweight equities due to the run-up. Should clients be thinking of trimming back? So most clients uh, were underweight heading into the decline. Uh, and when we did add exposure, uh, got them, you know, closer to a target weight. Um, however, you know, even despite the rally, it wasn't like every client increased their equity exposure at the absolute trough. Uh, it was over a multi-week period where we were able to get that implemented. So uh, in working with your client advisor, uh, it's probably best for you to kind of talk to your client advisor about what is most appropriate for your particular situation. Uh, but I'd be surprised if we have a lot of clients that are heavily overweight their target to equity exposure right now, uh, maybe modestly so, uh, but uh, you know, that that's kind of something up to you and your client advisor to determine whether or not it makes sense reducing exposure. As I said, uh, for the previous question, we still like equities here, um, within kind of the the market caps and styles and regions that we've said are appropriate for client capital, uh, but we're you know thoughtful certainly to every client's specific uh, risk profile and needs. Uh, so we would we would suggest you kind of speak to your client advisor about what's appropriate for you. Thank you, Chris. The next question comes from Ross. When you refer to repositioning the SQ global equity portfolio to higher quality, what do you mean? How do you define higher quality? Yeah, uh, this is Wayne, and I'll t touch a little bit on that. Some of the uh, uh, kind of thematic uh, allocations that we had within our equity portfolio is to uh, uh, kind of balance the quality slash defensive with, uh, with growth allocations. And that would echo some of the comments Chris made about uh, our our exposures to tech as well as healthcare. Um, quality, the quality allocation or the quality theme kind of falls along uh, inside that. And while uh, there is a somewhat more diverse uh, kind of framework in terms of how people or investors think about quality, so that some of the more consistent elements of that is that. They're looking for businesses before you think about pricing uh, or, or stock valuations. What they're thinking about is, are these companies that have resilient revenues, so kind of good visibility on uh, kind of revenue generation through uh, multiple periods, as well as good profitability or cash flow, and low utilization of financial leverage. Uh, so really, 
what that means are businesses uh, that you, you have a good sense of where the earnings are coming from and how sustainable those businesses are without a lot of financial risk when uh, in periods like this where kind of credit risk spikes uh, and it's hard to get access to capital. That ultimately results in companies that tend to have, or stocks that tend to have uh, lower uh, uh, volatility versus uh, its respective benchmarks. So if we're thinking about the S&P, stocks that just tend to not have the same kind of uh, up or down, uh, notably beneficial in periods of heightened volatility. Um, so yeah, so it's like the quality theme is a overweight uh, to stocks that have uh, higher quality or better visibility on top line with good operating margins with lower leverage, which may mean that maybe the top line doesn't grow as quickly. Uh, so in a big expansionary market, those would probably lag. Uh, but in a uncertain or declining market, the top line and the businesses tend to hold in better. Uh, one of the majors we utilize in that space also kind of parlays that with a, a value uh, component as well. So within that quality framework, companies that might be more attractive from a multiple perspective as well to uh, kind of lean, let's say kind of lean or tilt a little bit more towards the value construct uh, with that quality theme. And what that results in from a sector perspective is uh, a greater emphasis on consumer staples, healthcare, uh, you'd say real estate and financials fall in there too. Uh, to Chris's comment about being uh, underweight financials, yeah, like banks and credit sensitive and interest rate sensitive businesses uh, would fall within the financials bucket, which we want to shy away from. But there are, uh, when you think about that financials uh, kind of bucket, there's a lot of stuff in there, kind of like a a Berkshire Hathaway falls within financials, and Berkshire is not a bank. They do have insurance businesses, but it is a, a conglomerate uh, type business. So you get diversified exposure uh, with significant cash on the balance sheet to be able to deploy. Uh, his most recent uh, presentation, he's been kind of holding steady here, but um, uh, that kind of resiliency and balance sheet makes sense versus a bank that is uh, levered. Um, so, so that's kind of how we would define our quality allocation and kind of uh, aligns with the, uh, the themes around healthcare and tech. Thank you, Wayne. The next question comes in from Maureen. Given the current crisis, is now the time to buy life insurance? Thanks, Narcissus Bill. I'll take this one. Um, you know, the decision to buy life insurance really depends on your personal situation. Uh, my general thought that is that if you didn't have a need for life insurance pre-COVID, um, you probably don't have a need for it now. Uh, but with that said, if you haven't had the conversation, you know, with your financial advisor regarding your life insurance coverage, um, now is a good time to do it. You know, we we view life insurance for our clients as having two real main functions. Um, the first being income replacement, and you know that's obviously to cover lost income to your family should something happen to you. Uh, you know, this type of coverage is uh, generally obtained through like a temporary or term policies, um, which are fairly easy to get and tend to be relatively inexpensive. Um, you know, sometimes we do see someone that was relying on a group policy through an employer for this type of coverage, um, you know, which is then lost along with the job. And, um, you know, for this reason, I normally recommend against uh, relying on a group policy for income replacement coverage. You know, and, you know, the second main function we see for life insurance is, is estate planning, right? And, and that's to create liquidity, uh, whether it be for estate taxes, to generate funds to pass the next generation, to fund a trust, and so on. Um, you know, if, if this crisis has highlighted anything, uh, it's, it's the importance of making sure your estate plan is up to date. Um, you know, and in a permanent insurance policy may be an integral role, uh, have an integral role in your estate plan. Um, so if, if you do have a need for coverage though, um, now, now is a good time to get it. You know, we, we life insurance premiums are going to be increasing. Um, and, and this is not because of COVID directly, um, but because of the prospects that we're going to be in a continued and prolonged low interest rate environment, um, low interest rates impact the rates that are credited by insurance companies, uh, you know, to permanent policies such as whole life or guaranteed universal life policies. Um, 
you know, we've seen in recent years, dividend rates from insurance companies have dropped significantly. Um, this is probably going to continue in the near future. Um, you know, so th this really shows the need that your life insurance coverage needs to be managed. Um, it needs to be reviewed and uh, assessed periodically. Um, also, if you have older policies, you know, you should really make sure they're reviewed and that so that they're still going to provide the coverage that you need and expect. Um, so, you know, because this crisis may not be the, you know, the time to buy life insurance, but it's definitely the right time um, to review your needs with your financial advisor. Thank you, Bill. The next question comes in from Michael. What will be the impact on real estate and private equity funds? Should I commit to illiquids now or wait a year or two as more opportunities present themselves? How quickly will the managers call and put capital to work? Uh, this is Wayne. Um, there's a, a few points there, so we'll probably break it up and uh, Chris might chime in on a couple elements of that as well. But uh, maybe thinking about real estate first, and then the different elements within private equity uh, thereafter, and then we can talk about the opportunity set. But on real estate, obviously, uh, can everyone working from home and not in their offices or not in their stores or not shopping or visiting stores, like, it's pretty uh, kind of self-evident in terms of like the, the pain that real estate is uh, experiencing uh, in terms of uh, traffic or utilization. Now that doesn't flow directly uh, or immediately uh, to the the rent line, but where you do see it is that retail has remained under pressure even pre-COVID with the disruption of technology. Um, so uh, retailers and malls and strip malls, all that they, they've been under fundamental pr uh, pressure even prior to this, and obviously with the stay-at-home measures it further exacerbates uh, that element and there continues to be pressure from that side. Uh, overall, we've been uh, bearish on retail, uh, traditional retail, so I have avoided and sought managers that avoided a lot of retail exposure um, or retail exposure that was kind of uh, traffic driven as opposed to uh, uh, needs or lifestyle driven. Um, Office, same thing. That will come under pressure because people are feel, uh, are realizing that they need um, or that they can telecommute more often, where they uh, where otherwise it was less of a an ideal. And uh, when you do return to work, what do those offices look like? Obviously, you need more space per individual, but the but you're probably unlikely to pay the same amount uh, of square footage per person. So. All that does impact the real estate sector. Uh, well, industrials does well, right? Industrials should be doing well because logistics and delivery uh, from the supplier to the consumer is becoming ever more important, whether it's uh, fresh groceries uh, to um, toilet paper, uh, to your traditional appliances and technology and additional monitors and, and, and keyboards, what have you. So uh, I think it's hard to just kind of broad it, uh, put a broad brush on it. Um, but at the end of the day, there is a fundamental impact that is to the downside. It will, uh, uh, the more defenses being multifamily and industrial should hold in better uh, and show a little bit more resilience, but there is a lot of blocking and tackling that we're seeing at the operator level to make sure that uh, the, the value of the, the, the real estate longer term should be sustainable. What we have seen versus an OA situation is that leverage has come down and, and, and credit or, and bankers are more willing to work with the equity sponsors because this kind of caught everyone off guard. Even if you're conservative, it just really kind of changed the, uh, the operating profile of these businesses. So uh, there's a little, I'd say there's probably more collaboration. Uh, better to uh, kind of get paid six months from now, uh, but get paid in full rather than sending someone into bankruptcy and then being uncertain what your full recovery would be on that. So. Um, uh, there is more collaboration uh, and working uh, and working together, but uh, operators are trying to manage through that. And that echoes with private equity generally. Like uh, we, we won't touch too much on on, on uh, venture or growth or some more more idiosyncratic strategies. But looking at middle market buyout, high quality businesses that are performing well, that have gone through uh, kind of management transitions and operating restructurings, and are worth a lot more than uh, on entry. 
just got their uh, IPOs or their sales delayed. Um, obviously, that does change IRRs, even if you get the same price, or you change your returns, even though you get the same price, it might push it out another six months or what have you. Um, and then businesses that are sensitive in the sense of uh, medical uh, offices. Um, we always talk about the dental business where it's a high quality business with recurring revenues, with a, a known secular growth need, but dentists have no patients right now. Um, is that a bad business? Uh, probably right now it is because you have no revenue, but over the long term, they are, they are sustainable businesses. So there is the, the, um, the sourcing of capital across credit facilities and business lines with the expectation that as those businesses recover, you'll pay back those lines and, once again, lenders are working with sponsors to, um, to kind of get through this time. Bad businesses will be bad businesses regardless, uh, so those will go through bankruptcy. But high-quality businesses where they're in a temporary uh, kind of pressure point, there is more of a, uh, uh, a collaboration there uh, and utilization of, of balance sheet to kind of weather through this period. Maybe the final comment just around, is this a better time versus next year? Um, I would say this is a great time to be investing in, in private equity because you don't put your $1 commitment all into uh, deployed all at once. Uh, I would say transactions are still pretty light right now as, as, uh, as buyers and sellers are trying to find the right floor and the right valuation. Uh, but we take comfort in knowing that our, our underlying managers are prudent and long-term oriented and always looking for, for good opportunities and deals to enter. And that will take multiple years. Private equity does not deploy the full commitment within one or two or three quarters. It takes multiple years for that capital to be deployed. And as things stabilize, maybe there'll be a reacceleration of capital. Uh, but making the commitment now, uh, I think, particularly in some of the measures that we have, um, we have, we have a growth equity manager that focuses on healthcare and technology and technology enabled businesses. It's a brand new fund with no uh, risk in the portfolio today. It's just a fresh pool of capital. That I think is highly opportune to be able to be deploying into right now in that middle market or kind of buyout space. So um, I, I don't think you try to time private equity. I think uh, the, the current vintages will be, will, will be great and we'll have to see whether or not it persists into next year, but uh, this will be a good opportunity. Thank you, Wayne. While we're on the subject, uh, we've gotten a question in from Steve who asks, did you see a change for private equity partnerships in the anticipated timing for capital calls and for harvesting investments? Um, do I change for capital calls and harvesting investments? Harvesting gets a little bit tougher right now because deals uh, or indications of interest, uh, th things just get pushed, right? Because um, you don't know uh, what the, uh, the, the, the new dynamic of that business is. So everyone has taken a pause, and I think you see, has seen that in the public markets as well as in the private markets. Um, but that will come back once you kind of know what, what you're buying, and resilient businesses will still attra uh, attract uh, interest. And maybe you're tweaking multiples a little bit here and there, but good businesses will still want to be bought up. So... Uh, that's why I make the comment that it probably delays transactions, uh, but high quality businesses will still be bought and be rolled up and acquired. We tend to focus on middle market, smaller middle market opportunities that are, get, are the acquired as opposed to the ones that are trying to acquire. Um, uh, and we, have a high, we feel like we have a high quality portfolio there uh, to benefit from uh, transactions when they do come back. Um, and then do I see more, a change? What we are seeing, though, is there is more, um, interestingly, uh, there's more uh, private slash public partnerships where private capital is coming into public businesses or near public businesses to provide transition capital in this time period where a um, company was about to IPO, the IPO just got delayed, um, and they are experiencing revenue shortfalls in the near term, but they're high quality businesses. There's an opportunity to kind of step in to provide transition capital, which gives you a floor, which almost gives you like a, a downside protected um, 
uh, participation uh, in businesses that otherwise you probably wouldn't have been able to get a look. So some of those things are more opportunistic, uh, but, uh, but not, not to go all kumbaya here, but it does feel like there is a little bit more of a collaborative nature across um, uh, across the uh, the private, public, and kind of banking lending spectrum. Where that does diverge is more on the distressed side, um, where distressed investors and kind of typically uh, they're they're looking for restructuring situations to be able to come in. Uh, but they've been waiting and they've been a little bit more um, um, more patient to get capital deployed. Uh, but those are broken businesses that uh, kind of need significantly more uh, operational change as opposed to just a, uh, a balance sheet uh, adjustment. So, uh, yeah, so the dynamic is changing. Um, and uh, I would say it just expands the opportunity set across a lot of uh, different avenues, notably in privates, but also within the credit space. And we still see it uh, within pockets of, ec of public equities. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, Chris, before we move on to the next question, did you have anything to add on private equity or illiquids? Uh, just to reiterate Wayne's point, I think uh, we are still um, big believers of kind of the, the private markets here, um, both the allocations to private equity funds, whether it's a buyout or growth equity or venture, and to private debt, um, whether that's, you know, corporate debt or private debt, um, you know, funding private equity uh, companies. Uh, we think there are a lot of opportunities because uh, valuations are still low in a lot of those areas that didn't necessarily benefit from the recovery uh, that public equity saw over the last couple of weeks in response to the stimulus packages. So we are still uh, very much big proponents of the illiquid universe and continue to believe uh, it's a critical component of client portfolios. Great, thank you, Chris. Our next question comes in from Tom. What are your thoughts about energy and how have they evolved over the past year? How has the exposure to energy changed over the past year? Um, I'll make a couple of comments. Uh, Kind of Chris touched on this in the sense of uh, kind of thinking about energy and cyclicals. Um, we had shied away from uh, what's called GDP sensitive or commodity or um, uh, kind of expansionary or pro cyclical kind of industries because it, it still is uncertain and we get it. It's cheap, right? You look at energy stocks, you look at financial stocks, um, industri industrial, they, they all look cheap from a multiple perspective. Um, but you, you kind of have to make the call on how that uh, re-expansion looks. Now, just looking domestically, economies and businesses and cities are opening back up, which, is, which honestly is a, is a great headline, and, and, and it's good to see the, uh, the, the, the recovery uh, from, a, uh, from just the foot traffic out there, but it's still not the same. We're not going back to where we were in February, uh, kind of nowhere near that in the sense that uh, it's still different foot traffic and the engagement and the, the dollar spend is different when you go uh, like retail stores are open, but you're still doing curbside. So you can't go in and try on new outfits and you can't uh, compare across uh, the broader you know, uh, selection they might have. Uh, takeout versus dine in, the, the, the size of the checks are different. Um, so uh, that, that will impact the economy uh, and, and result in a, I guess, a slower recovery, uh, despite the headline of just kind of reopening. And uh, it'll, it'll just be slower. And I think there's still just another dynamic within energy itself, where because energy had been so cheap over the past couple of months, uh, you've been kind of uh, picking up all that supply and building up inventory. So uh, how quickly will that rebound? It doesn't seem like, or does it, it, we don't want to make the call that's going to rebound in any uh, quick and immediate uh, fashion. And energy, even if the commodity recovers, businesses are now coming under significantly more pressure as well. So even though we see the commodity, the commodity do well, uh, the, the corporate entities around them 
are are not in the same place and are continually under liquidity pressures, which frankly has been one of the elements that have been impacting banks as well. So um, it's it's still early. Uh, we don't feel like we need to be heroes by kind of making that that commit, that bet on energy. Uh, we are participating in the in the broader recovery via uh, high quality equities, um, and we think you'll get paid uh, with a higher a higher risk adjusted return in that in, in those sectors than uh, in the more pro cyclical ones. Thank you, Wayne. So at this time, there are no remaining questions in the queue. I'd like to thank everyone on the line for taking some time out of their day to participate in today's call. Thank you to Chris. Thank you, Darcy. And thank you, Wayne. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Bill. Thanks, Darcy. We appreciate all of you sharing your insights with us today. If you have any additional questions that we were not able to address during the call, please do not hesitate to send them to me at dobryan at simonquickadvisors.com, and we would be happy to address them offline. Thanks again for joining us and have a great evening.